following is a special presentation of the Buccaneers Sports Network. This is the Jay and Keith Show. Two broadcasters. Oh, yeah. Two microphones. And one meticulously scripted podcast. <laughs> you what? Just kidding. Get it, J.K.? You get it. That's what I thought was so uh, funny. It's not funny. Alongside Keith Brake, here's the voice of the Bucks, Jay Sandoz. All right, it is Jay and Keith, brand new. Finally, finally got our yes. own intro. Yes, it's good for you to be here. Yeah, it's, it is good for me to be here. I agree. Yeah, great on great on the open. Yeah, what boy we, Newman. What, what we got? A, what we got? A grade on the open. Uh. You know, I like that. A minus. A minus. A minus? Okay. Yeah, I would rather have more me than you. So, I mean, uh, clearly I'm going to mark off for that. Uh, but that's uh, probably me being me. Loving yep. me. Who doesn't love me? Everyone, um, everyone loves me. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't asked anybody. And I don't care what anybody else says, Jay. I love you. Oh, wow. That escalated quickly. Yeah. All right. Uh, you're like a You're like a, a cool, chill uncle to me. There you go. The cool, chill uncle. Yeah, I like the uncle vibe. The the uh, I prefer weird Uncle Jay. Weird uh, Uncle Jay. Well, I, I didn't I didn't want to go the creepy Uncle Ankle, yeah, but I yeah, mean, uncle if Diddles. you're gonna take it there, then I'll take it there. Yeah, I mean, Uncle Diddles could be there too, but oh yeah. uh, no, let's yeah. not do that. Yeah, no okay. Uncle Diddles. Okay, no, no. Uh, let's talk about. Let's see. What, what are we gonna do? Today? Well, we're gonna talk ETSU Mercer, right? So yeah. Today, so we're gonna preview that. We're gonna preview Southern Conference games. I'll give you a very quick run through of my power rankings that nobody cares about. Mm-hmm. Um. And then we got bold predictions. Yes, and the pick six. Oh, pick six, then bold predictions. Correct, correct. Okay. All right, so let's start with ETSU Mercer. Mm-hmm. And I think we have to start with Mercer first, honestly. They're playing the best football of anybody in Southern Conference. If you look at some uh, statistical things, like, you know, best scoring offense, best uh, defense as far as points allowed. You look at their number one and uh, two in rush defense, pass defense, Number one, a turnover margin. I mean, just, you know, blowing teams out. It's mm-hmm. uh, running away with it. Now, you know, you look at Chad, and, and Chet's played uh, uh, Illinois, and then you look at Mercer, and they played Auburn. So you, you kind of throw those games out, and then those teams have done what they should have done, which is when Mercer has uh, rolled some more teams. Uh, yep. And honestly, they, they've, they you know, what they did to Western last week was quite impressive. But the biggest thing watching when you cut on the game is how they use Devron Harper compared to what he was last year. Because I know he was on the team last year. I went and just looked at stats, went and looked at things. There's no games I could go back except for a little bit of ETSU last year. But they only threw right. him the ball twice last year. Devron Harper got two touches last year. So he had a total of 29 touches for Mercer last year. The whole year. Two touchdowns. He has 37 touches through five games. Ten touchdowns. Plus you had a kickoff return of 93 yards. And he's got 11 scores on the year and you know i'd heard of him when he was at gardner webb because he was a special teams all-american or honorable mention all-american mm-hmm. and we thought maybe sailors was going to be able to get that because he was a special teamer that year and so that's where i'd first heard devron harper and he went to mercer and was virtually not used but this year they're doing everything they can to get him the football he scored on a jet sweep against which i thought was poetic the first play against gardner webb his old team was a jet sweep 66 yard yep. touchdown and then they threw him the ball the next possession, and the first 14 points was Harper. But they line him up everywhere. They figure out ways to um, get a bad matchup to where either a linebacker, if you're a man, has to get him, or they put you in conflict with him and Ty James kind of both running down the field, and then one goes to the post, one goes to the corner. To me, that's the biggest difference. And in an extra year for Fred Payton in the offense. But when you look at Mercer, the first thing that jumps off the page is is Devron Harper, how special he is, and how Mercer does a great job of getting him the football. And he's not a very big dude either. He's like five foot eight, five nine, something like that. One maybe one sixty five. It's really easy when that guy is used in motion, and they put him in motion a lot this year pre snap. It's really easy to lose that guy behind the line of scrimmage, and you don't know whether he's going to come around the edge and take it all the way to the boundary, whether he's going to take it to the hashes, whether he's going to take it right around the tight end. You don't know where that guy is going to run with the football, and that makes him really, really dangerous because as he sees those lanes around the edge, or at the very least knows where he's supposed to go on a given play, and the defense doesn't know where he's going, um, he has the ability to... Get your eyes crossed up. 
because you're expecting him to come all the way out to one place and he's going to pop out somewhere else and you have no idea how he's trying to cut, when he's trying to cut, where he's trying to go upfield. Uh, he can be really, really difficult to keep track of behind the line of scrimmage. And I think that makes him such a handful as a matchup. But both those receivers have been really strong for them this year. And that comes back to Fred Payton. And Payton, I've said it before, okay, he has one or two every week that maybe he gets away with, you know, not throwing an interception where one is jumped, it's a jumped route and the linebacker can't hang on to it. Or it's a maybe it's a, a in an awkward place for the receiver and the safety has a crack at it but can only get one hand on it. Stuff like that. And it happens to him a little bit every now and then. But for the most part, he's really, really smart with the football. And compared to the beginning of the year, they have started pushing the ball down the field a little bit more, down the boundaries, using um, uh, Harper on wheel routes and, and, and using guys that can win one-on-one -on -one down the sideline and letting... Uh, Peyton find those players for big chunks of yardage in the vertical game too, that adds a whole new dimension to this offense and it makes Mercer more than just a, oh, they're a pretty good team. Mercer is a serious title contender again this year. Would not be the least bit shocked to see them win the whole, the, the whole thing in the Southern Conference and then maybe win a game or two in the playoffs as well and, and represent this league nationally uh, very well by the time it's all said and done. Yeah, you know, the the biggest part of the schedule, because you, you look at it, Mercer's obviously, you don't say we want to about ETSU in the start, but you still got to play the defending champions. Then you still got to play Furman, Sanford, Chattanooga. So some yeah. of the biggest games on their schedule is going to to come up here soon. That being said, they there's not a lot of flaws. You see them offensively. And again, I, I've watched. Uh, I watched. I did not watch any Auburn. I watched a little bit of Morehead State uh, when they uh, uh, played because e ETS they played on that Saturday, the early one, the August twenty seventh before the September came around. So they played the week zero, I guess, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. So I watched some of that. Watched Citadel Gardner Webb, Wofford, West Carolina, and they yeah. just get off to such good starts. But they're so creative in their offense and how they do the sleight of hand mm -hmm. and. You know, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors, especially with the unbalanced line to a balance or the line shift. It's yep. like 70s football. You know, they down set and all of a sudden everybody stands up and shifts over except for the center, and then they snap it quickly, and then there's a bunch of guys going in motion, and then they're faking handoffs and sweeps and counters and throwing, and sometimes they throw it and they keep it. So it's just – it's a lot of can they keep you guessing. And it's very simple, but there's so much sleight of hand, so much movement. All they need is that little crease of you didn't – one guy didn't do his job, mm -hmm. and they caught you in the right spot, and it hits for big plays. And ETSU last year had a hard time with that, uh, especially about mid-second quarter through the third quarter. And Mercer really had their way. Ty James had eight catches for 224 yep. against ETSU, broke a tackle – uh, on basically a, a skinny post and then went 60-some yards uh, for a touchdown, and that was on Elijah Huzzy. Now, Huzzy ended up getting some revenge with a couple of interceptions there uh, on the day. He had the last – matter of fact, last time Fred Payton was picked off was Elijah Huzzy in the fourth mm -hmm. quarter that set up uh, ETSU's Malik Murray touchdown to take the lead. Fred Payton comes back down, gets him in field goal range. Fossler obviously misses the, the field goal. He's also on the squad. You know, he's wanting to get another chance to, to maybe have a chance to kick a game-winning field goal. Mm -hmm. My thing for Mercer is they really haven't been in a close game. Uh, and, and I guess technically they were for a while with the Citadel. And 17 nothing relatively is relatively close considering you look at their scores. But three scores is not really a close game, I don't think. And the fact that it was in the midst of where Citadel just couldn't move the football and score. Mm -hmm. uh, Citadel played tough defense. They really were in their base. They didn't get, you know, out of position a lot. It was really a couple big plays. But Citadel did the best job of, like, just staying on their keys, not losing it. My thing is, can ETSU make this a typical ETSU-Mercer game? Last mm -hmm. six have been decided by one score or less. Can they keep it to a one-score game? The last six games – they played against each other. Since ETSU's been in Southern Conference, Mercer scored 151 points and ETSU 149. It's about as tight as you can get uh, a ball game. And I think if ETSU can keep it there, be curious to see, does Mercer start to press a little bit? Because they've had all that success early. Now, if Mercer goes up 14, 17 early, you know, it could lights out, look out, because they're great. They've proven it front running. 
But if ETSU was able to get a couple touchdown leads, I don't think Mert's going to panic. But how does that change? And does Fred Payton and the rest of the offense start you know, to press a little bit where they've been able to have as much fun as they've wanted? And the big thing here is you need a disciplined, well-coached defense with a really, really sound Mike linebacker who knows what he's looking at, knows how to get your guys into alignment. You need to be extremely well-prepared. And for ETSU to have Billy Taylor and for the defense to be totally bought into what Billy's teaching them and preaching to them uh, every week, I think that really is going to help ETSU out here. And you kind of saw that with the Citadel is where Mercer had some situations where they couldn't move the football because the Citadel wasn't buying into a lot of the the chaos that, that Mercer tries to create with a lot of the offensive line shifts that you're talking about and a lot of the different motions that they use. And it, it was a little bit tougher for Mercer to break through against that group. I think we're in for something similar for ETSU. I think the, the real question is, it's kind of like the chat. It's going to be like kind of like the Chattanooga game. I feel like there's a very real possibility this plays out like chat. ETSU comes out like gangbusters. They execute their game script. They get an early ten point lead, and Mercer has to play from behind. Can ETSU do a better job of seeing out that game on both sides of the ball, especially on offense, because that's where you know complementary you know, the both sides of the ball kind of complement each other. And the offense didn't hold up its end against Chat, and that allowed Chat to lean on the defense, get them tired, and then open up some big holes down the field to hit some big plays in the in the late third and, and into the fourth quarter. Can ETSU's offense move the ball more consistently once it's off those first 10, 12 plays that you script uh, if they can get that lead? And, and if you do, I think you have a chance to pull the upset here against a really good Mercer team at home, but it is a, a gargantuan task for ETSU to go down there and beat this Bears group. They're good. Yeah, I think the the one thing, the big difference, Mercer against the Rush this year, you look at every team they played except for Auburn, they've held below uh, their average rushing. They held Moorhead State 6.7 yards under their average rushing, 67 yards for the Citadel, 45 for Gardner-Webb, 2.8 for Wofford. But by the way, Wofford's only averaging 70, 70 Wofford Terriers. 70 yards rushing their average in all Ouch. Year. And that's for a team that traditionally, obviously... Or perhaps more appropriately, woof. Yeah. Yeah. The Toothless Terriers. Can I go back to that? Uh, Western Carolina, they held them 63 under uh, their rushing yards. Now, ETSU, and even going back to um, uh, 2015, now that, obviously, the first year of football, they lost 52 nothing in that game. They, they, uh, ETS, they held ETSU 84 yards under their average. That's fair. Then you get into, since they joined the league in 2016, they held them 29 under their average. ETSU was 59 over their average in 17, 45 in 2018, 238 over. That was the 410-yard game where uh, Quay Holmes set the single game rushing mm -hmm. record, which was only bested by Jacob Saylor's uh, last year. Uh, then they held them in, in the spring of 21 under four. Uh, and then 53 yards over their average last year, 213 yards uh, rushing uh, ETSU in that game. So ETSU has been able to run the football. They've been able to control it. That's going to be the biggest question. ETSU used Juwan Martin last week. They were able to be creative in not just him blocking, but also using decoys um, mm -hmm. to get him the football, have him run the ball, have him catch in the flat, you know, do some play action. We saw some read option with Baron May in there. Um, we, you know, They've been trying to work more RPOs in for uh, – so not so much uh, – for Baron May, it's more of a true read option where he's going to keep and run the football. But they are going to uh, work some more RPOs where Tyler Rydell has an option to hand off or throw the football. So there will be some of those wrinkles, I think, that will be continue to be added in. Coach said they made the playbook thinner and uh, just wanted to make sure that they ran more plays efficiently as opposed to just having more plays. I think having Jawan Martin and having him be able to just kind of bulldoze people, and I believe they will continue to do that and use him in different ways because he can catch. He's basically, you know, for this offense, an H-back or a, a tight end. He's a fullback, yeah. but he could do other things. And so I'll be curious to see how they continue to use um, Jawan Martin from there. The other thing, Keith, the last three weeks, the starting offense, you're talking about one turnover. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know there were more turnovers at Robert Morris. That was Brock Landis and, you know, some garbage time late fourth quarter. But the starting offense the last three weeks, just one 
turnover, and then you're talking about ETSU's defense continued to turn people over, a minimum of three turnovers the last three games. So I think uh, plus special teams plays. Um, you look at uh, you know the the block punt that happened. There was the block field goal. It was block punting against Rob Morris. So there was a block field goal against Chattanooga, maybe more so on the snap, but Rodney Wright still able to get that. And then, you know, the defense being able to not just get takeaways, but put ETSU in plus territory to get points on the board. ETSU 51 points off turnovers, just giving up 13. So the defense stingy, if, even if ETSU does turn the football over, opponents uh, just 13 points off turnovers. So a lot of stats, a lot of things. ETSU is better on third downs. And that's going to be interesting to see if they can continue to uh, get that number. go. Now, overall numbers are still going to look not very well. Mm-hmm. I think I sent uh, Keith you the stat yesterday. I don't know if I can even look it up fast enough on the uh, third downs. But I know on third and short, ETSU was just under 50%. Uh, I think it was 47. Then, um, yeah, yeah, it was 47% on third and short, 28% third and medium, and 24% third and long. Yep. They are – uh, in third and long – I'm sorry. Yeah, they're in third and long still almost 50% of the time. First down plays ETSU has gotten better. T- two yards or less just 42% of the time. It's down from 49%. 19% of the time, though, they're getting 10 yards more. So they're still getting chunk plays on first down, but it's a little bit feast or famine. Here was the kicker for me on the third down statistical breakdown. By quarters – in the first quarter, ETSU is converting 41%. Second quarter, 32%, not bad. Third quarter, 35%, not yeah. bad. 18% in the fourth quarter, that's obviously got to yeah, be better. That's not good. That's not good. And that is an offense that needs to play with more urgency and throw the ball than they are being asked to play with in the first three quarters because you're in negative game script, you're behind in games, and all of a sudden it becomes a lot tougher to hit the plays that you need to hit to convert on third and seven or third and six, where ETSU seems to be finding itself a lot of times. And that has that got better against VMI. That's something that they did better against VMI was get into better situations on first down and convert third downs when it came down to it. And I'm going to circle back to Jawan Martin because you talked about that early and I didn't get a chance to jump in on that. I love fullback football. Give me two man backfields with a big dude that's more than, you know, and, and Jawan is more than just a meat stick back there, right? He's not just somebody that is going to pave the way for your running back by hitting a linebacker in the hole. He is somebody who can catch. He's somebody who can run it himself. He's a legitimate multi-purpose threat that you have to respect. And he can also, say you're in a play action situation, you can use Juwan as an additional blocker and release Sailors into the flat as a check down instead of having to wait for Sailors to, or having to have Sailors wait to potentially pick up a blitzer. Like you, you open up so many different things that you can do with your offense schematically when you have a fullback. And I think ETSU has started to sprinkle that back in. And that's going to pay dividends for the Bucks against teams in the second half of the year, utilizing that extra backfield presence and utilizing, I think, more heavy personnel in general. You know, we saw that trend with uh, the Rams in particular were really big on using like 12 personnel and 13 personnel sets where you have one running back, maybe, but you have three tight ends. Uh, you have the 49ers that are big on 21 personnel where it's two running backs. So it's a running back and a fullback and, and a tight end or 22 personnel where it's running back, fullback, two tight ends. You're seeing more and more of that in the NFL. We've kind of gone through that trend, and maybe it's phased out a little bit because of all the RPO stuff that teams are trying to implement, but there is still a place for it. It's still valid, and it's still very effective against Southern Conference teams and Southern Conference defenses. Just line up in something that's really straightforward and out-execute the other team on the other side of the ball um, and ETSU has shown an ability that, that to do that. They can do that uh, when you put Jawan Martin in the football game, and, and that's something that uh, you're going to need, especially when you get into third and short situations where ETSU has to be better at converting third and two, third and three when they do get into those situations. Jawan can help a ton in those areas. I, I, and you didn't listen to every game last year, but there's no doubt uh, I'm a huge fullback fan. I, I mark out a little bit when uh, Juwan Martin <laughs> is able to score a touchdown, and he's just – he's so good uh, at at so many different things. Blocking's physical. 
uh, just knows how to get the right leverage, and he's got soft hands. I mean, he makes incredible catches, um, and they've proven they've been able to throw him the football. I think they're going to expand. So I would be shocked because I had so much success last week. Mercer's proven they've given up a lot. No matter who the head coach is, uh, Bobby Lammer, Drew Chronic, they're going to – can give up some rushing yards to ETSU. They're mm-hmm. able to be able to do so. So I think ETSU knows it. I think they're going to, um, you know, try to capitalize off that. But there's still some things ETSU's got to do, um, I think, to, to keep the chains moving because Mercer is great at teams. They have great team speed. Not particularly great. They don't have a, a front like Chattanooga. Of course, nobody does, I don't mm-hmm. think, uh, around uh, these parts of uh, FCS football. Just a massive line. But the speed that Chet has at linebacker, Mercer matches that, and Mercer matches it on the defensive front. So moving laterally, which ETSU is pretty good about trying to get Jacob Sailors in space, some other stuff here, I think they're going to have to try to get some in-between tackles, run some more counters, a little wham block with Martin coming through and trapping and some other fancy things, the football sounding that, uh, you know, that's old school style, ran from a spread set. And then I think they need to utilize some play action. I think they need to be able to run the football play action. And last year, Tyler Rodell had his best game as a Buccaneer, 26 of 29, threw three touchdown passes. Big part a couple, of why they won that game. Man. Yeah, threw three huge touchdown passes, two to Malik Murray on the bookends front and back, and then uh, the one right before half to Will Huzzy, the old uh, sort of skinny post where he throws up near the goal post and let Will Huzzy do Will Huzzy things. And so I think that will be very important for ETSU to be able to run the football, utilize the play action, and then Anaj Carter's proven he can hit some big plays, even though he's a little – um, you know, slot receiver. Uh, they're utilizing his speed, similar to Devron Harper, uh, not to the extent of Devron Harper, but still they're trying to use Anosh Carter in that role. And so, uh, you know, can Huzzy have a big one? Can Anosh Carter have a big one? Can they run the football? I think this is going to be a tight game. Uh, I know Mercer's been rolling people and will probably be a – I wouldn't shock me if they're not an 8- to 10-point favorite when the wise guys throw it out there, but I think this will be a tight football game. And – can ETSU turn over Mercer, or can Mercer turn over ETSU? I think that could be the swing in the game. Well, I mean, if you want, I can pull up the Massey ratings right now and give you a score. Yeah, what do you got? A Mercer 31, ETSU 21. Mercer favored 9.5 in the Massey ratings computer system, which is very – that's something that I am very fond of. I like the Massey ratings. I think it's a, it's a good system. Sagarin is also good, and the fact that the playoff committee – doesn't have some sort of computer metric. The simple rating system is not something that it's it's completely uh, opaque. It's something that could I mean they could put any sort of variables in there. We don't know what they do. I would like to have some sort of hard and fast metric like college hockey does with the pairwise ratings that we know how teams stack up nationally. But in the meantime. I'm, I've always been very fond of Massey. I think it's a really uh, easily navigated, navigable system as opposed to the Sagarin ratings, which are just like somebody copy-pasted a notepad document on a website. But anyway, um, both are good. Massey, which I have in front of me, says Mercer probably about 10 points. And then... I, I think that's fair. If you look at scores, do score comparison. Agreed. Yeah. Something, I mean, it's, it's and that's a lot of at, what that's based on. Yeah. So, you know, they use a uh, little bit of total yards here and there and a little bit of this and that. But I, I that seems like that's where that – I mean, without knowing that, I was kind of right on where um, that no. was going to be. And I think, you know, I don't think – unless there's turnovers, I think it's going to be a one-score game. And we'll come down to who makes plays right. later. And the question is, ETSU this year has not made those plays in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. And it comes down to Mercer hasn't had to make any plays in the fourth quarter. Right. We'll see how it goes. And I'm inclined to agree with you. I think it's going to be a pretty tight football game. I will say, conditionally, if Mercer were to win this game by a similar margin to the way they beat Western, I think we need to talk about Mercer as a seed in the playoffs. I think because it's clear that they have the quality. If they can beat a team with ETSU's talent, just the raw talent, throw out you know what execution stuff may or may not happen during the game. If they can beat a team with ETSU's talent the way that they beat Wofford, then we need to talk about Mer- Mercer is a seed. Like Mercer is a seed caliber team at that point and needs to be seriously put in the discussion 
for one of the top eight spots in a first round bye in the FCS playoffs. And and I would quadruple down at that point that Mercer's going to win the SoCon. I think they're going to win the SoCon anyway. I, I think this is this is a really, really complete, sound, well-coached football team that ETSU is going to match up with on Saturday. And I think ETSU is going to play them tough, and we'll see what happens in the fourth quarter. But if the worst happens, then it, it does kind of confirm some of my priors about the Bears. Well, well, we'll see how it plays out. I think it's interesting. Um, ETSU Mercer, certainly, they've had some some great football games. They've had meaningful football games. This one maybe not as meaningful as the last two because there was a championship on line for Mercer. Obviously, mm-hmm. it won't kill their chances if they drop this because they could still win out and still would hold tiebreakers if they won out on every single team. So they could do that. ETSU championship, obviously, is not going to happen. Right. So, um, you know, but can ETSU continue to build? Can they string along enough wins to maybe get back into if their bubble was dropping to a six-win team or if ETSU pulled off a top 25 FBS win at Mississippi State? That would get you very much in consideration. If you win all of your remaining games, I think ETSU gets in at that point. Yeah. If you're 8-3 and three with an FBS win against an SEC school, you're in. Yeah, and, and right now that's ranked. So if it yeah. happened to be a ranked team, but we know that's that more. So, yes, there's still things going now. I'm not obviously predicting all this. You've got to – Pete Mercer, that would be the next step. So, right. uh, anyway, it's going to be great. It'll be a 2.30 pregame show. 4 o'clock will be the kickoff between ETSU and the Mercer Bears. da 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 Okay. All right, let's take a look at the Southern Conference games. It's the Citadel and the Wofford. I'm on green. Uh, boy, he's more of a thrower than I thought. Went back and watched it. Holy cow. He's got a, a nice arm. He can press the ball down the field and do triple option. So if they could stick with – Citadel could stick with him and let him take some lumps and figure it out, I think Citadel may have something offensively to get that triple option up and going. For the Terriers and Jimmy Wyrick, boy, they – you know, a lot of fight. And considering our coach quit on them on Thursday, and they were able to um, not just lay down, but to get a stop in the fourth quarter yep. in the red zone, yep. go down, score, get an onside kick, continue to go. Now they got a full week, right? Can they win despite everything that's going on? This is Wofford's best chance to win. For the Citadel, they scored their first point since ETSU last week, their first touchdown since ETSU. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about this game because we're going to talk about it in a little bit. But, uh, yeah, this is a, uh, a game for two teams that – are not going to the playoffs. These teams do not have postseasons in their future. They're playing for pride, but pride means a lot, especially in the Southern Conference. And especially when, you know, you, you got an opportunity to win a game, you go take that opportunity. And both of these teams might be their best opportunity to win left this year. I don't know. The Citadel, I think, still has VMI, right? So they, they got a shot at it. Wofford, I believe, still has VMI. So maybe you could win that game too, but... Uh, I, I think both of these teams are looking at this and saying this is our best chance to win this year because Wofford gets the Citadel at home this week. Uh, you know, it's got a team that's a, got a little bit of a chip on its shoulder. Uh, they do get VMI at home later this year, but they, they, they are feeling okay. They were able to hang in a little bit closer than a lot of people thought they would with Sanford. So uh, it's going to be very interesting. I expect this to be a very tight football game. VMI and Chattanooga, the key dads, have to learn how to take care of the football and quickly because the mocks are great at taking it away. Yeah, this They've had a up. week off. Uh, VMI can't stop the run. Chattanooga can run. Do we need to do a lot more analysis here? Uh, Lim Ford over under 200 yards this week. Oh, my gosh. I think, I think as a squad – um, they're going to be close to three bills, and I would say he's at least – I'm going to put him down for at least 175. Okay. Is that fair? Okay, that's fair. Okay. Um, t- 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 let's go Western Carolina and Furman. Boo, the Cats got declawed last week, uh, and yeah. that was that was shocking. Like it went, Once it started to go south, the lack of interest from the Catamounts secondary to even remotely attempt to like stand in a guy's way to tackle was a bit alarming – that being said, they're a team that could throw a lot of points on the board. Tyler Huff was back for Furman. Um, 
you know, they did a great job of creating turnovers, especially fumbles from the Citadel, and then cashing those in for two second half scores. Yeah. So if Furman can do what everyone else has done in West Carolina, which is create takeaways, then I think Furman's going to be able to roll in the Battle of the Purples. But if the Catamounts could not turn it over, they could throw some points on the board, and this could be a high scoring, entertaining game. I don't think they're going to stop Furman offensively, mm-hmm. but they could have a shot maybe to outscore them if they don't turn it over. Why do you hate the color purple on a football uniform so much? This, this game's got to make your stomach turn because you you are not a fan of that color. No, no, I'm not a fan. I just don't think you should lose anybody wearing purple. And I think it may even go back to my early days as a kid as a Celtic fan against the Lakers and uh, huh. some other purple teams. But also I grew up in Western North Carolina junior high, high school, and that you know a lot of my – friends were like hey let's go to the western game and i'm like i just I can't, I can't i don't know i can't pur- i'm just not a purple guy it's it maybe it's a me purple problem purple guy it's purple a, guy it's a me problem there's no doubt Indeed. about that so um well Indeed. all right that being said we got that going out of the way yeah, that's that's, that, that's, that's enough all that. the so kind let's just let's just pick them let's pick them the best games of the week or at least the ones these two dorks want to watch no! It's the pick six. You pick that up all by yourself. The pick six. Last week, Jay and I picked six games, and then we picked an extra point, which only counts if we get it right, uh, which is an underdog pick, and we both got those wrong. I went four and two. Jay went two and four. So that just still does not sound right. Looking for a bounce back week. I'm gonna start you out. This is the reason I didn't talk about this. This is this is for the college football sicko in all of us. At the 50-yard line is the Citadel at Wafford. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here's, so again, no, 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 okay. no. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Massey, which we had just talked about, projects this as the tightest FCS game in the country this week. The score projection is 21-20 Wofford, and the Terriers are given a 51% chance to win. It is basically... A coin flip between two teams lurking at the bottom of the SoCon standings. This is this game is made for sickos. It is because Wofford's got a chance to finally get a win with a 16 in a row. I think they've lost. Well, Citadel right, yeah. has. Uh, this is a battle where two teams have gone 11 quarters between scores. Wofford <laughs> was to start the season. The Citadel was from ETSU to when they finally scored a touchdown against Furman. On a busted play where Ahmad Green made a play. I mean, honestly, he scrambled around. He threw it up in the end zone and ended up being caught. Looked like it was going to be intercepted, but it worked out for a touchdown. So, Green looks like he could run the option and they can control the football. Wofford has had its issues. Uh, Landon Parker certainly is a guy that's come in and started to make some plays in the in the pass game, gone from rece- uh, tight end to receiver. But not having Josh Conklin there, I think the Terriers. You think so? Despite, despite, I know people are probably driving off the road again. I'm, I'm picking the Terriers, but Conklin's not there. I well, was the show proponent. isn't live, so they can just pause it and come back when they get home. I guess, but I like to, I like to believe that people like to listen to me on the drive home. But, sure, that's entirely you know, reasonable. You know, I mean, you, you know. have a captive audience. You can't, yeah. you can't. I mean, go some anywhere. people like to pray to the six pound. Uh, Eight ounce baby Jesus. I like the people to uh, you know listen to me. I don't know two words yet. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. All right. That's what I'm, I'm going to go offered. What, what, what do you got? Let's say you. Um, I'm going to go with the Citadel because I think the Citadel is the better team, and I think Wofford is a team that, despite the chip on its shoulder, I don't see them matching the physicality of the Citadel. The Citadel plays hard, especially on defense. Their offense will be a little sloppy. They'll make some mistakes, but their defense will more than make up for it. I don't really see Wofford as a team that's going to score a lot of points on a disciplined defense that's playing in a neutral game situation for most of the game. It's going to come down to the end. This is a fourth quarter football game, but give me El Cid to win in the first game of the pick six. Second game, 40-yard line. Um, We're going to go out west to the Wax Sun. Tarleton at Stephen F. Austin. Two high-flying, high-scoring teams. Of course, Stephen F. Austin scored 98 on Wagner a few weeks back, so maybe that skews the numbers a little bit, but uh, the, the, the Lumberjacks have got some work to do. That is a team that is uh, staring at... Well, they, they've already lost their first game of the year in conference play. Um, 
where they lost to Sam Houston. They did get a win over Abilene Christian. Uh, so they're, I guess they're what? That would make them one and one, right? So they're, uh, they're a team that the, the Wax Suns doing the power rankings thing. Mm-hmm. So according mm-hmm. to the power rankings, they're in the Catbird seat, but they're also three and three. Then they've lost to three basically FBS teams. It's Warner, not Wagner. Uh, they beat Alcorn State, Warner, and Abilene. And Abilene was tight. And Tarleton has looked pretty strong so far this year. And I still vividly remember when they went to New Mexico State and absolutely thrashed the Aggies in an FBS game. They've been putting up big totals. They played a fun game with Southern Utah. They won 42-40. This game's going to be a tight one and a high-scoring one as well, anticipating a track meet. Yeah, I'm thinking 45-42. I don't, I don't know what you think about that. 45-42, Battle of Texas, right? Uh, you look at Sam Houston State. You look at Tarleton State. Tarleton State's trying to make a name for themselves. They're averaging 35 a game, but this is two teams that I think are going to be able to put a ton of points. It'll be entertaining. Agreed. This would be one. And, you know, when you think ton points on the board, I think a lot of people think they just, you know, throw the football, but – both teams average a good bit on the ground. Tarleton State's mm-hmm. averaging almost uh, 189 yards on the ground. Sam Houston State's, I think, at 175 on the ground. So, it's teams that run it. They throw it everywhere. I think um, God, this is a good one. Uh, I'm going to take Tarleton State. Still trying to make a name for themselves. Still trying to put a stamp. This game, yep. I think, means more to Tarleton State than Sam Houston State. So Stephen that- F. Austin. Stephen F. Austin, whichever one. I yeah. don't care. Which is, some of them. But Sam Houston, Stephen F. It's an S. It's a state. There's something in there. Uh, and Austin in there, uh, which is all in Texas. So, at least I got the state right. But uh, that's how much of disrespect I'm giving uh, Stephen F. Austin right now. I'm going uh, Tarleton State, not because I forgot who they are, but because I was already leaning that way to Tarleton State. I am very interested to see how well Tarleton does in this particular matchup. I don't know that they've been truly – tested yet by their schedule. I know Stephen F. Austin hasn't been tested by their schedule. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the sense that they haven't played a team that they're going to jockey with for the playoffs. They've played basically three FBS teams. They played Jacksonville State, they played Sam Houston, and they played Louisiana Tech. So they, they're playing a Conference USA schedule. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, I look at Tarleton, North Alabama. Tuna's not going to test you much, right? At least not right now. Mississippi Valley State, Eastern New Mexico, they won their tight game with Southern Utah, which is uh, maybe a little bit better than the caliber of team they were playing before. Uh, I, I don't know. I, my gut tells me Stephen F. Austin is still somewhere in there. Somewhere in there is the team that we thought the Lumberjacks would be at the beginning of the year. So I'm going to take Stephen F. Austin to win. Okay, 30, so- 30 yard line. We can go quick. We've already talked about this one. Western Carolina at Furman. Gosh, you know, I got burned from Western last week. They're not going to get me again. I'm going to go Furman. If, if if Western can hang on to the football, I think they got plenty of shots to beat people because they are very creative and can score. But when things go south, they, yeah. they, it's kind of been there, done that. So I think the Paladins. I'm going to take the Paladins as well. Just think they're too good up front for, for Western to match up with them. Uh, all right. Now another, I got another Sickos game for you. I got another Sickos game for you. 20-yard uh, line. UConn at Ball State. UConn is looking for its most wins in a season since 2015 when they went to a bowl, Jay Sandos, going to Muncie this week to take on the Ball State. Are they the, they're the Cardinals. Yeah, Ball State Cardinals. Yeah, Cardinals. Yep. Um, and this is one that, you know, Jim Moore Jr. is starting to get things going there, uh, and I didn't think he was going to because some of the early results, they were going to be 50 burgers left in a rank. Then I think they were like a 20-something point underdog, ended up – Coming out with a big win, yes, you have to really just um, – only us would look at this game, I think, ever. Agreed. So, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I think Jim Moore Jr. is doing some great things. He's getting uh, some solid play really defensively where they were – I mean, lost Utah State in a fairly close one, 31-20, beat Central Connecticut State. I don't know if that counts or not. Then they got rolled, 48-14, 50-0, 41-10. Then the big win at Fresno State, right? Yeah, but they were also playing Cuse, Michigan, and NC State. I mean, those are those are yep. good opponents. Yep. 
uh, and Syracuse was ranked, uh, or not ranked when they played them. I think they're ranked now, aren't they? But anyways, yeah. uh, Fresno State, and then they beat uh, our good buddy Donovan Manuel last week at Florida International, 33-12. to So defensively, they were getting things going. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Ball State had the uninspired win against, was, or was it Miami of Ohio? Who beat Robert Morris? Was that, was that Miami of Ohio? It was Miami of uh, Ohio. I believe that was Miami, that was Miami yeah, of Ohio. I believe that was Miami uh, of Ohio. I was really going to go uh, Connecticut just for that simple reason, because you couldn't uh, beat Robert Morris by uh, 40, which every team has since that game. <laughs> uh, but I, I think defensively, UConn there, getting better, but I'm going to take Ball State at home. Okay. No rationale, just vibes. Give me the Huskies. I mean, it roll. It's, it's hard to argue. A couple back-to-back. It's all vibes. Great de- it's 100% okay. vibes. Okay. I'm going with UConn. The team's playing well. They've got some – they have an iota of confidence, and they have a former NFL head coach. I'm going to take UConn to go on the road and win at Ball State. All right. Ten-yard line. Get this one out of the way. It's the biggest game in the country this week, Alabama-Tennessee. We don't know who's quarterbacking yet, do we? We do not. You know, Tennessee's got everything going – Alabama had the scare last week. I thought I was going to be a genius. I thought I was absolutely going to be able to hit a bunch of um. You stubborn, nope, that was the wrong stupid. one. Yeah, there it was. <laughs> there it was. Yeah, there it was. I am the smartest that, man that's alive. what that's what you wanted to hit. Well, this is my Western take. You stubborn, stupid, silly man. Yeah, that's that. that yeah, all right, stubborn, anyways. stupid, silly man. That being said, I think Alabama had the scare. They go on the road. Tennessee, boy, they've been waiting on this forever. I mean, they're sitting on a powder keg of fans that are ready to, to I, I don't know what, throw babies in the air if, the, if mm-hmm. Tennessee were to win or uh, whatever is going to happen. But I think, man, I just don't know who the quarterback is. I think Tennessee's going to give them a heck of a ball game. I think but Alabama's going to be Alabama and win a squeaker. I think it'll be an absolute squeaker. I said last week to all the Tennessee fans that asked me about Tennessee LSU, I said LSU wouldn't give them a fight. Tennessee would roll them. All the Tennessee fans are – one guy told me he's, he's suffering from vol, uh battered syndrome uh, from believing <laughs> in him and all that, and, and that it was going to be a dog fight, and he'd probably lose it and break their heart. And I'm like, I don't know. I've watched some LSU. I'd watched a few Tennessee, and I was like, I just don't think they match up well. Alabama will obviously match up better than LSU did. Tennessee will be able to use the home fans. I think they get off to a good start. I just think they're not, they're almost there, but they're not quite there yet. And I think it's a squeaker, but I think Alabama's going to win. We need some differentiation in our picks so that one of us does and one of us dies, so so to speak. It's if it's do or die for the pick six. So give me the balls at home. This is the time. This is the moment. There has never been a time. Better than this one. I was actually at Neyland Stadium the last time UT beat Bama in 06 when uh, Eric Ainge threw three picks and they didn't run the ball super great and their defense lifted them to the win. I think this is the time that they break the slump and uh, UT UT gets the win. All right, yep. final game, goal line, South Dakota State at North Dakota I State. The Dakota marker, there. number one and number two in the country. Uh, wh- what are we thinking? The Jackrabbits have won four of the last six regular season meetings between these two. And uh, last year, they were luxury at home. They got off to a great start, right? Didn't South Dakota State jump yeah. out to a, a lead? North Dakota State comes storming back. Last week, North Dakota State had the little bit of a scare, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they were a little sluggish against Indiana State. They were a little sluggish. But held on 31-20. Do, do what teams do, right? I mean, yep. Just mm-hmm. like Alabama held on against Texas A&M, the – the, the cream of the crop. Well, I mean, South Coast State's no doubt they have figured out a little bit of the formula. They do a lot of trick plays, a lot of, uh, you know, this, this they do a lot of preparation for North Dakota State that's outside of their norm. I think North Dakota State always treats South Dakota State as any other opponent as far as preparation because when you I've watched a few of those games it's one of the you know I don't watch a lot and didn't watch a lot of North Dakota State regular season games because there's really no need to they were just rolling everybody but I always did watch some of that and I was always amazed how North Dakota State just kind of stuck with who they are and South Dakota State always seemed to have you know uh, snap the ball the running back or uh, uh, you know hook and latch some sort of plays uh, that were out of the norm that they were always prepared for. And South Dakota State, you know, if there was ever a time, right, I mean, 
their only loss this year was that weird seven to three where they didn't give up a touchdown to Iowa. Yeah. They gave up the two safeties yep. and a field goal. So I I think it's going to be man. North Dakota State had their scare last week, similar to Alabama. I think North Dakota State at home after the scare last week, a little bit of a wake up call. Plus, South Dakota State obviously has had some success. The win last year. I think North Dakota State is going to be able to hold serve at home. I have watched so many of these games, and they all come down to the wire, and they all come down to which team can run the ball effectively in big moments. And, you know, most times that's been, honestly, it's been South Dakota State. Like, they've been able to run the ball a little bit better, and that's opened things up for them offensively in other areas. Uh, They've been able to capitalize on miscues. And then the other element of it, and this is their first game against the Bison without Jason Eck at offensive coordinator. He's now the head coach at Idaho. Eck always had two or three just completely wild trick plays that they would run. Pierre Strong Jr. threw a passing touchdown in the game a couple of years ago. Actually, last year, threw a passing touchdown in the game, a direct snap to the running back at the goal line. I mean, again, they always have something dialed up for them. They always have something. Now their offensive coordinator that did all of that stuff is gone. So what do they do? John Stigelmeyer called. You know, they ran a shotgun spread with Jake Winicky, Dallas Goddard. You know, was their tight end, and they just chewed teams up in the passing game with Taron Christian at quarterback. And John Stigelmeyer hated it. He called it communist football. He said, "We're going to get back to the fundamentals, power run game." Isaiah Davis, great back, tough to tackle. NDSU didn't miss a ton of tackles last week against Indiana State. It's just a matter of can their offense execute. And if their offense rises to the occasion, I think the Bison are going to be fine. Um, But SDSU just seems to be more confident right now in in, uh, playing to that end. They are playing like the more confident team. They cakewalked against USD, a team that's okay. They beat Missouri State earlier this year. Um, I, I think I see a team that's got a lot of confidence but I can't pick the Jackrabbits. I just can't do it. Give me North Dakota State. What a homer. Still a homer. Look, <laughs> no. He's a homer. I just, I can't, I can't pick him. I can't, I can't pick him for anything. I can't pick him for anything. Tyler Merriam's great. Everybody else, whatever. It's prediction time. Yes, prediction. Something big. Bold. Sometimes right. I can see the future. Most times wrong. Did that go the way you thought it was going to go? Nope. Never dull. I'm trying to write all this down. This is shocking. Was that bold enough? This is Bold Prediction. Prediction? Pain. Somewhere Scott Lawson's going to love that because every time... I know. I, that's why I did it. I figured that's that That's exactly it. why I did figured it because every time he's in your replies on <sighs> Facebook with Mr. T. All right. I've, uh, I went another 0 for... So I'm uh, 3 for... 3 for 16. You went 0 for... Um, yep. Yeah. Mine were uh, Tennessee State 0 and 5. That well, that whiffed. Quarterback, I, I thought we might see a quarterback rushing touchdown. That whiffed. So 0 for 2 there. And then I told you during Missouri the game on State. Saturday, my third one is Missouri State misses the playoffs. And that was as they were getting ready to start playing Southern Illinois. And Southern Illinois beat the brakes off of them in Springfield. And I now said, I'm going to go ahead and give you that one because they're out. So yeah. that's, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, all right. What do you got for this week? Full all predictions. Right. All right, I'm going because I just I've already I've already told you how much I love Juwan Martin. Mm-hmm. He's going to find the end zone. Ah, oh, you son of a! Is that what you had? Yes. All right, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. How about I give you a different one? How about the last person to pick off Fred Payton was Elijah Huzzy? The next person to pick off Fred Payton is going to be Elijah Huzzy. Okay, okay, that's if, consistent we'll, with my Fred Payton doesn't throw a pick in October. Okay, okay. I'll go I'll Huzzy. Get, I'll go that. And you go... Jawan uh, Martin, Martin scores a touchdown. touchdown. Okay. Jawan Martin scores a touchdown this week. Yeah. All right. So then my <laughs> second one is Florida State at home. They cost me in pick six last week. They're going to knock off the Clemson Tigers at home. You want me to, you want me to call Culhane and just be like, hey, dude, what happened? What's the deal? Yeah, I, I feel good. But, I mean, they got two Wilsons and a Pittman. Uh, they're very good wide receivers. Mm-hmm. I think they'll find all three of those. They'll all be able to give Clemson fits. Yep. Uh, DJ Ungalele is having a little bit of issues. I think – Oh, Ungale. Whatever it is. Uh, Florida State is going – sorry, uh, DJ. Um, I think Florida State is going to bounce back and get a win. Uh, 
I'll M Ford 200 plus yards for Chattanooga this week. You said 160. I think he's going oh, nice. to hit 200. Uh, and then uh, you'll love this last one. I'm going with Gunner Tuckington to have a huge day in Eastern Washington, even though they're one in like a thousand. And Sac State undefeated, five and zero. Oh. Eastern Washington could happen. Dub. It's not. It's not the most outlandish thing you've said since I started on this podcast. Uh, my final one is I, I'm doing another long term play. UConn goes bowling. You didn't get your extra point in. Did you have oh, a game? Yeah, I keep forgetting that. I have an extra point. I need a, a big dog. You, need, big a, you dog. need a big, big dog. dog. Big dog. Give me one second. Give me one second. I don't know the Florida State's going to classify as a big dog, so I got to find a big dog. I yeah, went, I don't know that. They I are. went twenty point plus. Oh, I got a great one. Yeah. Old Southern Conference team. Two touchdown dog at home against a top 25 team. That's Georgia Southern will knock off James Madison this weekend. Hey, that'd be a good one. That'd be a good one. Uh, I think I'm looking I'm looking at my list. Oh, no. What do I have? How about uh, quickly, quickly, quickly. Uh, Ten Cal, Cal beats Colorado. Ooh, Cal beats Colorado. Has Colorado won a game yet? Uh, no. Okay. Has Cal won a game yet? Has anybody won a game yet? Yes. Okay, there we go. All right, there we go. Another edition of Santo Sidekick. Back with you on Monday. Back in the door network. Oh, you gotta be kidding me!